To finish out section 9.1, we're going to take a look at bounded and monotonic sequences and what happens when we have a sequence that is both bounded and monotonic. The first concept we need to understand is the concept of monotonic. And a sequence is monotonic if it's either non-increasing or non-decreasing. So essentially what we're saying is A1 has to be less than or equal to A2 and less than or equal to A3, etc., all the way through the last term of the sequence. So the fact that it's or equal to is why it's monotonic. You might have also heard the term strictly monotonic, which is where it cannot be equal to. Uh, for instance, if I take a look at the Fibonacci sequence, which starts with one, and then one, and then we add one plus one to get two, and one plus two to get three, and two plus three to get five. This is a monotonic sequence because it's increasing or, for those first two terms, staying the same. So it is monotonic, but it is not strictly monotonic because one is the same for the first term and second term. So let's take a look at how I can determine whether a function is monotonic, and we're going to look at three different strategies. So for the first strategy, it's just plug and chug, A1, A2, A3. Plug in one to get four minus negative one to the first. So four minus negative one is four plus one or five. Four minus negative one squared would be four minus positive one, which would be three. Four minus negative one to the third would be four minus negative one, which is five. So I can stop right there. This decreased and then it increased. So it's not monotonic because it decreased and increased in the same function. So this is not monotonic. So that's the first strategy. The second strategy is just to look at it more analytically. So without having to find A1, A2, A3, I could say, all right, this guy is obviously going to oscillate between negative one and positive one. And if I take some value and add one and subtract one and add one and subtract one, it's very clear that it's not going to strictly increase or decrease, that it's going to be not monotonic or non-monotonic. If I look at example B, again, let's start by looking at it just analytically. If I look at it analytically, and I'm not going to do this strategy here, if I just look at it analytically, the numerator is going to increase every time n increases. The denominator is going to increase every time n increases. So then the question becomes, great, <laughs> which one's increasing faster? Because I could have a function like 1 half and then take my numerator plus one each time, but my denominator say times three each time. And if I do that, uh, 54, if I do that, what's happening to the fraction? One half is 0.5, two sixths or one third is 0.3 repeating. We get the idea that since this guy is an increasing at a faster rate, that even though both values are positive, my fraction is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, one half, one third, one sixth, etc. So even though they're both positive, the de denominator was increasing at a faster rate. So what's happening in my fraction is Every time I increase n by 1, this guy is going to increase by 5, and this guy is only going to increase by 1, because n is increasing by 1 each time. And so that means the numerator is increasing faster, and if the numerator is increasing faster, then the value is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is monotonic, and it's increasing. And again, if you wanted to just verify, feel free to find a sub one, which would be um, five fourths, and a sub two, which would be two, and a sub three, which would be 15 
fit, uh, nope, sorry, a sub 3, 15 sixths or 5 halves. And we can see that it is in fact increasing. The other way, or the more mathy way to do this, is of course to find a derivative. So if you'll recall, back when we learned about derivatives for the first time, we said, hey, if your function, if the derivative of the function is less than zero, where the derivative is simply the slope of the tangent line at that point, if the derivative is less than zero, then your function is decreasing. And if your derivative function is greater than zero or positive, that means that the function itself is increasing. So let's take a look at that for f of x is equal to 5x over x plus 3. f prime of x, the derivative, would be using the quotient rule. So the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator over the denominator squared. My numerator, if I distribute, gives me 5x plus 15 minus 5x over x plus 3, quantity squared. And obviously those 5x's will cancel, so f prime of x is 15 over x plus 3, quantity squared. And what that tells me is 15 divided by some quantity squared, that quantity always has to be positive. So a positive divided by a positive is always a positive. This value is always greater than zero. And because that derivative function is always greater than zero, then my function is always increasing, which is what I had determined anyway. Now that we have talked about monotonic, let's talk about bounded. If we have some value of m that is greater than or equal to all values of my sequence, and that's all this guy means, is for all n means for every a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way through a sub n, if each of those values is less than or equal to m, then the sequence is bounded above by m. If every value is greater than some arbitrary value of n, then the sequence is bounded below by n. If it's both bounded above and below, then it's considered bounded. So let's take a look at the same two examples that we just looked at and determine whether or not our sequences are bounded. For my first sequence, if I recall, a sub 1 gave me 5 and a sub 2 gave me 3. And we determined that if I continued to find these values, I would keep getting 3s and 5s and 3s and 5s. So this, in fact, is bounded above and below. This function's never going to give me anything less than 3, and it's never going to give me anything greater than 5. So I can say that my first function is bounded above and below, by below by 3 and above by 5. Let's look at my second example. The first example, or the first value, if I plugged in 1, was 5 fourths, and then I plugged in 2, and I got 2, and then I plugged in 3, and I got 15 sixths, or 5 thirds, and I didn't really determine what that top value is going to be, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I know for sure that it's bounded below by 5 fourths, and I know that because we determined this was monotonic, monotonic, and it was never going to decrease. So I know that 5 fourths is the absolute lowest value. Now, is it bounded above? Well, I don't want to keep making a list. You know, that's super fun, but how about we just math it up a little bit and take the limit as n approaches infinity of this function of 5n over n plus 3. And we've determined a couple of different ways that we can look at the limit of this function. One of the ways is to look at those most influential terms. So this is going to be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 5n over n, which is 5. So that means it is in fact bounded above. It's going to continue to approach 5. 
So both of these functions are considered bounded because they are bounded both below and above. Which of course brings us to the point of this video. Why do we care if a function is bounded and monotonic? Well, because we have a theorem that says if you have a sequence that is both bounded and monotonic, then it converges and it converges to the limit, to the limit of the sequence. So this guy, example B, was my only example that was both monotonic and bounded. So we said this guy was between 5 fourths and 5. And we said it was monotonic because it was always increasing. So this is a graph of the function to show us that in fact it is increasing and that it's bounded above by 5. So if we were asked to determine the limit of the sequence or if it converges, we know for a fact that this converges by theorem 9.5 of our textbook that says if it's bounded and monotonic, it converges and it's going to converge to the limit. We already sort of determined that limit, right? The limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n was 5, so it converges to 5. Coming up next, we're going to take a closer look at an infinite summation, which we call an infinite series, which essentially means we're taking a sequence and adding up all of the terms of that sequence.